Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Abby Sachs. I serve as the program manager for the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy, uh, which is a program of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley. Uh, and I'm excited to have you all joining us, both in person and those who are joining us virtually. So last semester marked the first partnership event between the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy and the Frederick Meyer Honors College. And I'm thrilled to be continuing that partnership with tonight's keynote event. The Wheelhouse Talk series is a unique opportunity for students and community members to gather and learn from a leader about their leadership journey and reflect on their own path. The Frederick Meyer Lecture Series offers valuable perspectives from business leaders across industries on leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. It's been a natural move to bring these two series together, and our speaker tonight is a perfect combination of those two things. I am thankful to Roger Gillis, director of the Honors College, and Mayor Rosalind Bliss, uh, who serves as the Meyer Endowed Chair for the Honors College for the opportunity to partner tonight. And I would now like to introduce Roger to the podium to say a few words about Frederick Meyer and his impact at Grand Valley in the community. Thank you, Abby. And I want to thank uh, all the people in the Cook Leadership Academy and the Howenstein Center for their help with this series, and it's been a great partnership so far. Um, I do want to acknowledge the legacy of Fred and Lena Meyer and their commitment to leadership and entre entrepreneurship and innovation here in West Michigan and around the world, and also their support of this series and its focus on the importance of um, liberal arts education and uh, interdisciplinary thinking to a successful life and career, um, and the Meyer Foundation generally for its support of the Honors College and this series. Also, our office of uh, Meyer Office of Fellowships, which helps students, a lot of our students, honor students and students around the university, um, pursue international and national opportunities for travel and growth and, and, uh, and scholarship. Um, and also the uh, Meyer uh, Office, I'm sorry, the Meyer Endowed Chair of Entrepreneurship and Innovation that Abby mentioned which is currently held by the mayor of Grand Rapids, Rosalind Bliss, and she has been uh, with us for eight semesters now. This is our eighth and final semester with us, and in that time, she's done a fantastic job bringing um, two people in every semester, uh, local leaders, to talk about their journeys in our Fireside Chat series, and uh, teaching a class called Effective Leadership and um, Creative Problem Solving. And I have heard such great things about her class. She helps students kind of reflect on their own leadership styles um, to build new strategies and to practice leadership in the community. And so we're very grateful for Rosalind and the, and the time she spent with us, and we appreciate it very much. And Rosalind, as, as part of her job as chair of the, in, of the endowed chair, is to introduce our speaker tonight. So I'll turn it over to Rosalind. Good evening on this beautiful wintry day. I love being a four season city. I always remind people that we should embrace that and enjoy all that Michigan and Grand Rapids has to offer. And um, I'm really delighted to be here tonight with you. Uh, I have had uh, in my lifetime the pleasure to get to know Fred and Lena, and it really is an honor to help to carry on their legacy. We all know what a huge impact they had on our city and our community, and I believe that they're looking down right now, and they feel really proud of the work that's being done here at the college to continue that legacy, so thank you. Uh, and now I get to introduce an amazing speaker, an amazing woman, I should say, who's going to speak with us tonight, uh, and I'll ask you to join me in welcoming her, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Her, re her resume is quite long, so I'm just going to amend it and say a few things, and then she will share with you some of her journey uh, with us while she's speaking. So Dr. Dara Richardson Heron is a former Fortune 100 corporate executive, current board director, physician, executive mentor, a coach, public speaker that we'll hear tonight. Uh, and she's been doing that for more than 25 years. Uh, she has led excellent work in healthcare, uh, in corporations, in government, and nonprofit sectors. She's a frequent speaker on strategic leadership, health equity, clinical trial diversity, vaccine confidence, women empowerment, uh, which we need a lot uh, right now. <laughs> Many of us do. She has a proven track record of successfully driving transformative change, which she'll talk about tonight. She's well known for her creativity and authenticity. She's her intellect, her curiosity, her unwavering determination to help others leverage their leadership skills. 
She currently serves as the president and CEO of DRH Consulting. She's an executive coach at Exco Leadership Group. She's a board director at Caribou Biosciences and the Hastings Center for Bioethics. She holds a doctorate in medicine from New York University School of Medicine, and she completed her internal medicine residency at NYU Medical Center Bellevue Hospital in New York City. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Barnard College, where she is currently a trustee, and she completed executive human resource leadership and management training at the University of Michigan. Please join me in giving a very warm Grand Rapids welcome to Dr. Dara Richardson Heron. Well, hello, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see each of you in the audience. And thank you so much, Mayor Roslin, for your, your kind introduction. And thanks also for your leadership as the mayor of uh, Grand Rapids and also as the endowed chair of the Frederick Meyer Honors College. I also uh, must express uh, my um, deep appreciation to Roger Gillis, director of the Honors College, and of course, Megan Rydecki, uh, director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies for the invitation and opportunity to be here with each of you this evening. And by the way, um, uh, Megan, I want you to accept my heartfelt congratulations on your new role as director. She shared with me last evening, um, we were at a, a women's commission event, that she's been in her role for pre precisely three weeks. And it's quite, quite clear that she's um, already hit the ground running. And a little birdie uh, told me that Megan is also, um, and I quote, Grand Rapids famous, end quote. So <laughs> Megan, it's quite an honor uh, to be in, in your presence. Um, I also have to thank Abby Sachs, who, may or may not be that little birdie, uh, but many of you um, uh, know Abby as a program manager for the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy and the Howenstein Center, but in addition to being an incredibly empathic and passionate advocate and program manager, uh, Abby is one of the absolute finest in the area of Midwestern hospitality. So thank you, Abby, I really appreciate that. And Brent Holmes, also the associate director, I just wanna extend my thanks to him. Um, because I had an opportunity to speak with him a few weeks ago while preparing for this presentation. And, and lastly, but certainly not least, I wanna give a huge thank you and shout out to everyone who took the time out of your schedules to join us here today, uh, whether in person or virtually, especially the esteemed students of the Honors College, the Cook Leadership Academy, and all of the Grand Valley State University students who are with us here today. And I, I know we're competing, uh, with the President's Ball, um, but that's okay. All of the really cool people are here at the Wheelhouse Talk, including my new friends that I uh, convinced to join us this evening, uh, Claudia uh, Bajima and my future co-author, uh, Carrie, the, the GVSU Athletic Director. Both of them I just met uh, last evening. So it, it's really an honor uh, to have been invited to do a wheelhouse talk. Uh, and during my research, I, I, I learned that a wheelhouse talks are for thinking leaders and leading thinkers. Take a moment to think about that. Thinking leaders and leading thinkers. I, I just love that phrase, you know, because I know that without a shadow of a doubt, that 21st century leaders, particularly those leading transformational change, they have to be thinking leaders and leading thinkers in order to be successful. And, and it's just wonderful to be in a room filled with so many extraordinary leaders of all ages and accomplishments. Opinion and thought leaders, I have the opportunity to meet some of you, uh, business and professional leaders, volunteers, community leaders, and the next generation of trailblazers, all of whom are on a mission to make the world a better place. And, I know for sure that I could learn a great deal from each of you. So it's just humbling, honestly, to, to have been invited to share my personal leadership story with you. So thank you again for the coveted opportunity. So let's dive in. Over the years, you may have seen the TV commercial and advertising campaign for Capital One Bank, um, a credit card where the actor Samuel Jackson asks a question, what's in your wallet? Anybody seen that? It plays over and over in New York. And he asked this question to catch the attention of potential customers with the inference being that one's life will be enhanced significantly if they just have a Capital One credit card in their wallet. Now, 
for many reasons, I, having a Capital One credit card or any other credit card for that matter may or may not significantly enhance your life. But as I was brainstorming the title um, uh, for my presentation today, given that it is a wheelhouse talk, you know, I said, how about the title, What's in Your Leadership Wheelhouse? I said, I kind of like that. My thought was if simply having a Capital One credit card in your wallet has the potential to significantly enhance your life, certainly having the right elements in your leadership wheelhouse at the right time has the potential to significantly enhance not only your own life, but also the lives of others. And as I thought more about the title, I had a moment of sudden revelation and an insight, an epiphany of sorts. What was my epiphany? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, my epiphany was the realization that I actually have firsthand experience at having the right elements in my own personal leadership wheelhouse at the right time over the course of my personal life and career has absolutely and unequivocally enhanced my own life. And it's also provided me with the honor and privilege to be blessed to enhance the life of others. So since I've been asked to share a bit about my personal and career journey, and experience leading through transformational change. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to use this coveted opportunity to share insight into what's in my leadership wheelhouse. So to start, I'd be remiss if, if I didn't acknowledge that the foundation of my wheelhouse was actually laid by my parents, who were my first role models. Uh, they regularly recited the phrase, to whom much is given, much is required. And from early on, they made it very clear to all of us my two older sisters and I and my younger sister, that we were not brought into this world just to serve ourselves. They had expectations for us to leverage our time, our talents, our resources, and our passions to enhance the lives of others. They fully expected us to do our part to make the world a better place because we are here. And I'm so grateful that they lived long enough to uh, at least see a few modest returns on their investments. And even though they're unfortunately no longer with us here on this earth, their presence is felt daily. And I'm determined to stay on course to exceed their expectations. And to that end, I had an opportunity to do a TED lecture a while back. And I spoke about a few of the key ingredients in my leadership wheelhouse at the time. I spoke about the three Ps, patience, perspective, and perseverance. Now, let me talk about the first P, patience. Well, patience is definitely... Uh, a virtue that we apparently all are not all born with. Or let me just say I wasn't. My parents told me that by the time I reached the ripe old age of two that I was highly confident that I was already prepared to lead my two older sisters and my parents. Um, but suffice it to say, I was not even close to being ready to lead anyone or anything as I was neither literally nor figuratively out of diapers. Note to self, wearing diapers is not a good look for any leaders under any circumstances. Now, I've matured um, tremendously over the years, but in full transparency, uh, patience is still not um, my strong suit. But thankfully, there are other role models to emulate in this regard. In this regard, People like Peter C. Cook, one of the quintessential leaders and co-founders of this program. Many of you know that Mr. Cook actually started his career on a manufacturing line, making 17 cents an hour. He undoubtedly had leadership aspirations early on, but understood that he needed to first do a great job where he was. He needed to remain humble and respectful, and most importantly, he needed to exercise patience, as it was clear that it would take him time to hone his craft, to gain leadership skills, to seek new opportunities and learn from his mentors And as he advanced his career. And advance his career he did. He went on from the manufacturing line to ultimately becoming one of the first Americans to import the Volkswagen brand. He was named the president of Import Motors in 1954, and he became one of the Midwest's leading distributors of Volkswagen, Porsche, and Audi. He even founded a new company, Transnational Motors Incorporated, that grew into 130 dealerships, no doubt. Patience was one of the critical elements in his leadership wheelhouse. You know, patience helps keeps help us keeps helps us keep our wits about us while we gain the insight, the lived experience, 
the understanding, the intelligence, and, and all the things that we need to move forward, to move to the next level. But most importantly, patient provi patience provides us with the time and space we need to actually accomplish something before we attempt to lead. Now, the second P I spoke about is perspective. Extraordinary leaders cannot survive without a healthy dose of perspective. Sometimes as leaders and high achievers, in order to expand or advance our leadership abilities, we're given roles, responsibilities, and assignments that intentionally stretch our thinking and taking us out of our comfort zones. These positions are sometimes called developmental opportunities and, and sometimes just as we're getting ourselves mentally prepared to take on the challenge head on, a pesky little negative voice in our head spooks us up by reminding us that our skills and experiences don't exactly match every bullet on the job description or assignment, or even worse, that negative voice tells us that we aren't qualified or we aren't worthy of the role or the responsibility. Now, it's very important to know your strengths and your weaknesses, of course, um, and having a healthy dose of uh, perspective in your leadership wheelhouse will help you stay positive, motivated, and determined not to allow that little pesky voice, those feelings of doubt, inadequacy, and discouragement um, um, deter you from doing the job. Many of you have heard the term imposter syndrome. How many of you have heard it? When you look at the definition, it's defined as a physiological occurrence in which an individual doubts their skills, talents, or accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Many people who experience imposter syndrome actually do not believe that they deserve the success or the opportunities that they are afforded to advance their career. And get this, Imposter syndrome can creep into our minds even though there's an overwhelming amount of concrete evidence to demonstrate our competence, our judgment, and our abilities. Now, since imposter syndrome can rear its ugly head at any time, having a healthy dose of perspective will help you shut it down before it gets the best of you. And one great way to manage imposter syndrome is to develop a perspective that includes a new, a more positive response to missteps, to mistakes, and failure. Henry Ford, another Michigan icon, once said, and I quote, failure is the only opportunity to begin again more intelligently, end quote. So instead of beating yourself up for being human, for not knowing everything or for making a mistake or even failing at a task, particularly when you find yourself in uncharted territory, try to glean the learning, the learning value uh, and put everything in its proper perspective. And as Abby and I discussed yesterday, sometimes you really do have to fake it till you make it. Yeah, I said it. I did. I mean, you heard me right. Let's face it. There was no playbook prepared for me when I took my first CEO role. There was no COVID playbook for the world when the pandemic um, reared its ugly head, right? In fact, I've never, ever really had a playbook for any of the leadership roles, but I was able to achieve success because I took the time to learn about and emulate other strong leaders. I nurtured relationships. I leveraged the tools in my leadership wheelhouse and made sure that I surrounded myself with really smart people. And, and not only did I surround myself with them, I listened to them. I just spoke to one of the professors here who teaches a course on listening. Who knew, right? And I partnered with him to create the playbook as we move forward. And you know, I don't encourage recklessness, but I have to honestly tell you that as transformational leaders, we simply can't always wait until we feel 100% confident to start putting ourselves out there. True courage and impact actually comes from taking smart and calculated risks. Now, the third P I spoke about was perseverance. No matter how patient, uh, how much perspective you have as a leader, at some point in our lives, we're gonna be faced with unexpected personal and professional setbacks that rock us to our very core. But when we exercise patience in the process, when we leverage perspective, when we, these will help us transcend and, and persevere instead of allowing the setbacks or the negativity to defeat us. And, and we can use those setbacks and, and obstacles we face to help build our character, our strength, our personal and professional resolve, and even elevate us to new heights. 
you know, I've had some um, interesting times. I Earlier, I mentioned that by the ripe old age of two, that I was confident I could lead my parents and my older sisters. And you know what? I still don't know quite how that whole thing went so bad, but but it's water under the bridge now. I, but as a young child, I persevered. I, I, and with some much needed guidance um, and redirection from my parents, I continued building my leadership wheelhouse. And I'm quite pleased to share that I did in fact graduate from diapers. Um, I then went on to graduate from elementary school and high school. And at age uh, 17 in 1981, I traveled from my birthplace of Oklahoma City to New York City to study biology at Barnard College. And I was beyond excited when I graduated and I was accepted into my first choice medical school, NYU Medical School in 1985, I was laser focused on becoming a doctor. From as early as I can remember, this was one of the few times that I did not have a plan B. Note to my younger self, it's okay to be laser focused on your dream, but always, and I do mean always, have a plan B. But you know, Choosing to study medicine in New York and, and, and doing an internship and residency in Bellevue, the oldest public hospital in the United States, it was by no accident. I, I wanted to learn about healthcare and preventive medicine um, in one of the most diverse cities in the world and at a place where I'd have the opportunity to, to provide high quality care uh, for an incredibly diverse array of people who present it with an equally diverse um, a set of medical challenges and conditions. And my training at Bellevue was in many ways an inflection point. Um, because it was there where I actually saw patients, many who through no fault of their own presented with late stage, often preventable disease. And again, for years, I, I, I'd learned about health disparities in academic settings, but now I was on the front lines of seeing health disparities play out in a real way, often because people had inadequate or even no access to health care. I was at Bellevue at the height of the AIDS epi epidemic. Uh, many of you are not old enough to remember that, but some of you are. Um, but we had extremely limited treatment options, and tens of thousands of people were dying every day all around the world, much like what we're seeing in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was a devastating time, but it was also an aha moment for me, both personally and professionally. I, I realized that the impact that I was determined to create in the world will require me to think big, much bigger than the typical doctor's office, traditional clinical settings that were the norm at the time. I knew that I needed to make a bold move. I needed to chart a non-traditional path so that I could contribute not only to the medical profession, but to society as a whole. And so I followed my passion and that decision set me on a 30 year non-traditional career path that has spanned corporate, academic, nonprofit and government as the mayor mentioned. My first role after my medical training came about after discussing my leadership aspirations and passions with one of my mentors. He, he recommended that I consider a position as a staff physician at Consolidated Edison, a, a major Fortune 500 New York City area utility company. Now, that's kind of interesting, a doctor working at a utility. What's that all about? Um, it was a very non-traditional career ladder, um, but um, as a physician, they had full service medical clinics and he saw it as a real opportunity for me to expand not only my medical knowledge, but also add new elements to my leadership uh, wheelhouse as it relates to business. And I took his advice and accepted the position and I got quickly promoted to executive medical director. And in this role, I not only practiced medicine, but I also learned important leadership, business, profit and loss, human resources, and management skills, all of which have been extremely invaluable to me during my career tra trajectory. And while in this position, I also met the sweetest guy in the world, Earl, my husband, um, who we uh, got married in August of 1997. We were truly on the mountaintop after our wedding and the view was awesome. But just one short month after our honeymoon, our lives together took a very unfortunate turn. I was diagnosed with breast cancer and we were both absolutely devastated. It was surreal. I, I was writing thank you notes for wedding gifts and fighting for my life all while big clumps of my hair were falling out as a result of the treatment that would ultimately save my life. 
initially I cried and I cried and I cried. I was dehydrated from crying. I, I, and I constantly asked the question, why me? How could this be happening to me? I was at the pinnacle of my life and career. I, I was a new bride. It all seemed so unfair. I felt so powerless. And you know, one day I had an aha moment. And instead of asking the question, why me? I began to ask, why not me? What makes me think I'm so special that I should be exempt from life's challenges and setback? And you know what? At that very moment, I shut down my private, and I might add, very unproductive pity party and began to realize that sometimes when life throws you a very unexpected curveball, you got to put on your big girl or big boy pants and figure out how to catch it. So I stand before you as a 25 year and counting breast cancer survivor. My challenge and devastating setback helped me get ready for a major comeback so that I'd be fully prepared to do the work that I strongly believe I was put on this earth to do. In the words of Winston Churchill, mountaintops inspire leaders but valleys mature them. And, and let me be clear, my experience with breast cancer was a real valley experience. I definitely matured, and matured in ways that were unimaginable before then. And while I would never, ever, ever, ever wish the experience on anyone, I can assure you that my ability to persevere and not throw in the towel during my valley experience made me a better person, a better wife, a better friend, a better colleague and a better physician. And the experience also helped me fuel my passion and further refine my mission and calling as a transformational leader. To be perfectly honest, it took me a while to see the positive in the sit back. But when I did, I realized that I was, I was allowed to remain on this earth so that I could use my skills, my experience, my expertise, my power, my influence as a leader to significantly enhance the lives of others. That's my mission my calling and my passion. You know, the word passion is a word that guides each of our lives daily in so many ways. And according to Webster, passion is defined as a strong feeling of enthusiasm or excitement, an intense driving or overmastering feeling of conviction, a strong devotion to or about doing something, end quote. Passion is also synonymous with zeal, which implies energetic and unflagging pursuit of and devotion to a cause. So our personal passion impacts what we do every day and how we show up in the roar in the world. It's hard to lead transformational change if passion is not one of the key elements in your leadership wheelhouse. You know that feeling when you're totally on top of your game. When you're truly passionate about what you're doing, you're much more excited about getting out of bed in the morning. You're much more creative. You feel like you're making your mark on the world and you're willing to work overtime because you know that you are doing what it takes to truly make a difference. And after my life-changing Valley experience, I was determined not to waste any more time doing things that were not aligned with my passion. In fact, I intentionally began seeking out opportunities that align with my calling and I've been very fortunate in this regard. Earlier I mentioned, I, I mentioned my leadership position at Con Edison. In addition to my role as executive medical director, I had the opportunity to design, develop, and, and implement a comprehensive work home wellness program. And that was in the 90s uh, that focused on enhancing the overall mental and physical health and wellness of more than 16,000 employees and their families, long before companies were talking about the whole employee. My next role was at United Cerebral Palsy, where I served as the national chief medical officer. In this role, I advocated for legislation, I set up new clinics, and created an innovative medical school partnerships and developed curriculum to help physicians learn how to care for people with severe cognitive and physical disabilities truly one of the most rewarding um, and impactful experiences of my career. In my role in, as Susan G. Coleman, um, the breast cancer organization, I leverage my knowledge as a physician, along with my personal experiences as a breast cancer survivor, to secure funding for breast cancer research and partner with local and national media outlets and grassroots organizations to raise awareness uh, amongst millions of individuals. And you know, one of my most memorable moments while at Coleman came after I announced that I was leaving. I received floods of calls 
emails and notes, some from individuals I'd never personally met, but all of them saying that something I did or said saved their life. You know, how you interact with others and how you show up as a leader in this world is vitally important because you never know who's watching and most importantly, you don't know the magnitude of the impact you can have on another person's life. So I can't even begin to tell you how incredibly heartwarming it was for me to get this affirmation that I was actually succeeding in achieving my personal mission and doing exactly what I believe I was called on this earth to do. I was using the tools in my leadership wheelhouse to enhance the lives of others. Following my Coleman experience, I had the distinct honor of leading the YWCA of the USA, one of the world's oldest and largest multicultural organizations. In fact, it was the 25th largest nonprofit at the time. When I took that position, the organization was going through tremendous change. But you know what? I didn't just see the challenge, I saw the opportunity. And truth be told, that position stretched every one of my leadership muscles. But I'm proud to say that I played a pivotal role in helping to sustain an organization that was dedicated to eliminating racism and empowering women and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity, not just for some, but for all, when a time that it was needed the most. And after serving at the YWCA for five years, I, I was offered and accepted an opportunity um, to serve at the National Institutes of Health, where I worked on the legendary program called the All of Us Research Program, where it spearheaded landmark efforts to increase diversity in clinical trials. It was really amazing, and it was like a startup in the federal government, so wrap your mind around that. That was a little bit something. And in my most recent role at, at, at Pfizer, I had the unparalleled honor of partnering with a, a dream team of incomparable leaders and patient advocates at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, arguably one of the most challenging times in our nation's history. And among other accomplishments, I played a key role in helping our Pfizer team achieve diversity of engagement and participation in the landmark COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials, also in boosting vaccine confidence and increasing vaccine uptake, particularly in the underserved communities that were the hardest hit by the pandemic. Now, even I have to question my timing on this one, and because though I was recruited to Pfizer long before the word uh, COVID was in anyone's lexicon, my official start date was just one week after many corporate offices in New York, including Pfizer, were shut down, and just one week before the whole world essentially shut down. I, I had to lead a brand new global team through the computer screen, and I'm going to put that in the hashtag, not impeccable timing. And, but no one was exempt from the devastation that co was caused by the pandemic. And as I mentioned earlier, there was no playbook. And quite honestly, the COVID-19 playbook uh, is still being written as we speak. But despite the devastation, I often get asked, wh what was it like being there? And honestly, one of the most rewarding insights I had while at Pfizer was the realization that everyone in the organization was passionate, focused, aligned, and in lockstep, working in partnership to achieve one goal. It was equally exhilarating, challenging, exhausting, and rewarding. And as someone who's worked in and led many different types of organizations, I can tell you it's rare to have everybody focused on one goal. But given the enormous gravity of COVID, it was possible. And the end result, as we all know, being the first out of the gate to develop a safe vaccine in record time that was effective in helping to mitigate the devastation that was caused by COVID-19, it was magical. So uh, to wrap my career journey, let me just say that my diverse experiences in leadership have taught me that transformational leadership is rooted in having a well-equipped leadership wheelhouse, unrelenting passion, effective strategy, and the ability to lead through change and uncertain uncertainty with empathy, inspiration and compassion, no matter where you stand on the organizational chart. And I've devoted my life and career to transformational leadership. So I wanna assure you that I'm speaking to you as a practitioner with decades of lived experience. And I often get the question, what's a common thread um, that ties all your unusually diverse leadership experiences together? And my answer always is this, the common thread is that I'm making good on my parents' expectations and my own personal passion to leverage my time, talents, and exposure and experience to make the world a better place, to make a difference, because I am here. So I've given you a brief tour of my uh, career journey to date. 
I've shared a, a very uh, eye-opening personal valley, and, and I've highlighted a few key elements in my leadership wheelhouse. So um, I've also spoken about how a driving commitment to making the world a better place connects all of my roles. So now in the spirit of Mr. Howenstein, when he reflected on his wartime experiences and said the following, and I quote, in the 20th century, I saw with my own eyes the worst that leaders are capable of. In the 21st century, I want to encourage the best leadership possible so that the world will be better for my children's children. So in that spirit, I'd like to take a few moments to impart a few additional seeds of triumph that I've intentionally planted in my leadership wheelhouse over the years that have continued to bear fruit as I've elevated my career. My hope is that these insights uh, will encourage each of you to continue on your stellar journeys to be the best possible transformational leaders you can be in the 21st century, committed to making the world a better place for your children and your children's children. So here goes. Seed number one, don't confuse confidence with competence. Make sure you have the requisite knowledge, skills, experience, expertise, passion, and intestinal fortitude to lead. Don't make the mistake I did at age two. I was extremely confident, but not at all competent at age two. Um, and confidence, let me be clear, it's not a bad word. And, and you can absolutely be a leader at any age, but again, we talked about that being at fully potty trained first. Um, you really have to have accomplished something as a leader. Many of us have had the misfortune of working uh, with a, a leader who was highly confident, but not competent, and it's not pretty, right? So please promise me that you'll include both confidence and competence in your leadership wheelhouse. Number two, do never, 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 never allow anyone to limit your potential. I was a top performer at one of my jobs, but I wasn't even considered for leadership and development opportunities and it bothered me. I saw people around me that were being, you know, put in these special programs. And finally, one day I just asked the question, you know, why am I not being considered? And guess what? The head of the corporate leadership development program told me, and I got to quote this because it's just bananas. She said, we didn't think you'd be interested in considering additional leadership development because you're already a physician, end quote. Can you believe that? I mean, yeah, I'm already a physician, but they didn't even ask me. Somebody in some room made some decisions. I, well, as you might imagine, I, I let them know that being a physician was not my only dream. And, you know, I describe myself, you know, as a, a physician by trade and an advocate by choice. And this was one time I had to advocate for myself. So I urge each of you to do the same. When the time is right, be first to raise your hand to take on additional roles and assignments if you have the bandwidth to do it. I want to give one caveat. Avoid helium hands at all costs. I'm going to tell you more about helium hands in a few moments. But for now, just remember that you must always advocate for what you want in life and by all means, never let anyone limit your potential. Number three, understand that life is not fair, right? I learned this real life lesson very early on during my career, not only while treating patients at Bellevue who were dealt a bad hand, but also in the rough and tumble environment of being a woman in leadership. Uh, just yesterday in the Reflections Women Leadership Panel, um, a Samita Rhodes, the director of the GVSU Engineering Graduate Program, shared that not until she and um, several other women engineers spoke up, um, it, you know, was it clear that it was not appropriate for the leaders to ask only the, the female engineers in the room uh, to take minutes, right? You know, here they were, limited number of engineers that were female in the executive suite. And whenever the note taker wasn't present, inadvertently the women engineers were asked to take notes. Now, this may sound like a small thing to some people, but it's actually just one of the many, uh, they call them microaggressions. I don't really understand why they call them micro. It should be macroaggressions. But, you know, this is one of the uh, microaggressions that women in leadership often face. And trust me, after a while, they become cumulative and demoralizing. Um, as I shared in an interview in the New York Times on leadership a while back, life is not fair and equal opportunities are more equal for some than others. And in one of my prior positions, my immediate boss was an older physician who appeared to have little respect for women and women of color in particular. 
uh, during my very f first um, few weeks at work, his actions made it quite clear that he didn't respect me as a leader or as a physician. Now, instead of losing my cool and doing something that might jeopardize my position in the company, I respectfully and professionally push back whenever appropriate and focus my efforts on making a positive contribution, adding value and excelling in my position so that he would never, ever have an opportunity to say that I wasn't doing a good job. You know, the interesting thing about life, although it, it almost never happens as quickly as you would like for it to, when you do the right thing, good things happen, right? Likewise, when you do the wrong thing, it always comes back to haunt you. We've all heard the saying, what goes around comes around. Well, I continue to add significant value to the organization, and guess what happened? Remember that boss I told you about? Well, after just two and a half years on the job, that's right, I became his boss. Now, I'm not gloating, I promise you, but I have to tell you, every time I think about this, it makes me happy. It happened 20 years ago. I just get happy every time I think about it. But the lesson here is that during the course of our lives, we're going to almost certainly experience some form of racism, sexism, discrimination, or other form of unfair treatment. But if you're adding value, it will be nearly impossible for your impact to go unnoticed. And, and I just want to be clear that this life isn't fair, seed of triumph. It's not cover for enabling the perpetuation of systemic inequality. It's just a call out for courage, a call out to hang in there, a, a call out to choose your battles very strategically while you're advocating for change. It's a call out to continue running your own leadership race while maneuvering around roadblocks. In a word, it's a call out for resilience. As a scholar, uh, Yasmin Mogahed puts it, and I quote, Resilience is very different than being numb. Resilience means you experience, you feel, you fail, you hurt, you may fall, but you keep going, end quote. Number four, always lead with morality, integrity, and authenticity. Great leaders have a set of values-based skills in their leadership wheelhouse, which among many other things includes ethics, integrity, and honesty. And as a transformational leader, you must know who you are and you must be proud of it. You must be authentic and consistent in how you show up in the world. And you must also be willing to take a stand for what you believe in. In an introduction for, of, of Mr. Howenstein, that former Howenstein Center director Gleaves Whitney gave in 2006, he told the story of how back in the 1930s, Mr. Howenstein was a commissioned, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the army. His unit, which was north of Grand Rapids, just happened to be all African American. Now Mr. Howenstein supervised the work of these hardworking African American teams all week. And on Saturday afternoon, he wanted to take the men into the town to see a movie as a reward for their hard work and dedication to our country. But as the story goes, the owner of the movie palace in this particular town was white, and he carried with him the prejudices of the day, so he didn't want African Americans in his theater. Now, Mr. Howenstein regarded this owner's behavior as unacceptable, even morally outrageous. And to his everlasting credit, he successfully prevailed upon the owner to let the African-American workers into the movie theater. These men had been improving and beautifying the countryside everybody enjoyed, so they certainly should have been entitled to enjoy the cultural amenities of the area. Mr. Howenstein was a power, powerful pioneer in combating racism. He understood that this type of discrimination was completely wrong much earlier than the nation as a whole, and, and he didn't just sit idly by and allow it to happen. He did something about it. That's how a leader with morals, ethics, and integrity in their wheelhouse authentically shows up in the world. And that's a great look. Number five, don't mistake words for voice. Sometimes people feel that just because they have a seat at the table, or in the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda from the blockbuster or Broadway play, just because they're in the room where it happens, they have to say something, anything. And, and while I do think it's important for transformational leaders to get our voices in the room, and particularly women, in my opinion, it's also very important to know that having a real voice means having a track record of thoughtful ideas, successes, and accomplishments so that people actually want to hear what you have to say because they know you're going to take the time to say something that may add value. 
We've all seen people who talk incessantly, talk and talk and talk. They need to go to that listening class, right? But they talk all the time. And they just want to hear themselves talk. And that's not good. So don't mistake words for voice. Use your voice and your words wisely and use them strategically. Speak up when you have a question, an idea, when you feel you can add value, when you want to make a contribution, or when you need to confront negative or unfair behavior. And know that when you do this, your honed voice will reflect your personal brand and authenticity as a leader. Number six, be open to non-traditional career opportunities and experiences. As someone who's done it, I encourage everyone to consider taking at least one stretch role, a role outside of your comfort zone or your chosen area of study, a role that allows you to see and explore issues from different perspectives. Think about it. Um, uh, Colonel Howenstein was a war hero. He was a journalist. He was an advocate. He was an entre entrepreneur. He was a philanthropist. And he also held many other leadership uh, roles in his community. By all accounts, he was still leading and making a difference until his death at the age of 103. Yesterday, when the women were asked about their career paths, um, they summed it up very nicely and saying that their career paths were more like, and I quote, career jungle gyms, end quote. By design, each of these panelists are extremely successful. They each had a nonlinear, a winding path, and not one of them had any regrets. So don't be afraid to go out and explore. Don't have anyone lock you into. Number seven, in order to be transformational leaders, you must reduce stress in your life and you have to find balance. You know when we get on the airport, in the airplane, and they talk about putting on our masks first? We have to do that so that we can make sure we're in the right headspace and frame of mind to lead with character and empathy. We can't do that if we, if we don't make a concerted effort to take care of ourselves. And as it relates to finding balance, some people feel that it's a pipe dream, but while I'm certainly no role model for finding balance, I'm moving over to the camp now that says you actually can have it all, just not all at the same time. Life is kind of squishy, you know? When one area of your life is prominent, the other might have to uh, be diminished for a bit. You just have to be realistic and clear about what you want to prioritize at what time. And, and I also believe that you can and must stop and smell the roses. And in so doing, you still can be successful, perhaps even more successful. The speakers yesterday all spoke about their quote unquote light bulb moments. Those light bulb moments came when they took the time to relax and clear their head. So now again, if I'm being honest, I, I'm not the role model on this balance thing. Um, but throughout my life and career, um, I've had this severe case of helium hands, a term I mentioned earlier. It's a term that was actually coined by a doctor named by Dr. Pamela Peake. She's a, a nationally renowned physician. Um, and helium hands essentially means that before you know it, an opportunity presents itself and your hand is rising involuntarily to take on another assignment, although your plate's already full. This behavior makes it nearly impossible to achieve any type of balance in your life. Now, the reasons for my helium hands are multifactorial, but suffice it to say, one of the reasons that so many of us don't have enough balance in our lives is because we've forgotten a very important word. Who knows what that word is? Somebody tell me what the word is. No, it's right. It's capital N, capital O, exclamation point. My, in, my instincts tell me that I'm not the only one in this room who needs to brush up on the word. And it's a good word to use both in your personal and your professional life. Remember, when you say yes to everything, it's going to force you to have to say no to some of the things that you might like even more. And at the end of the day, saying yes to everything leaves you exhausted. And, and I want to make it clear that stopping to smell the roses is about so much more than literally smelling the roses. It's a reminder to all of us to pace ourselves and take time to be present and in the moment, whatever we're doing, whether it's work or with family. If COVID-19 didn't teach us anything, I hope it gave us all yet another stark reminder that tomorrow really is not promised and our lives can change dramatically in an instant, no matter who we are. So slow down, de-stress, find balance, take a moment to simply be and breathe and enjoy the beauty of life. And, and finally, express gratitude. Remember, leadership is a privilege. It's not a right. We should all take a few moments each day to reflect 
on how blessed and fortunate we really are to have the opportunity to serve as leaders and role models. Despite the pressures and obstacles we all face, there are so many people who'd love to be in our shoes. People living in poverty right here in the United States and those living in other countries who, who really face unspeakable obstacles, challenges, and tragedies that are far more war far worse than anything any of us can ever imagine. So every day, despite what is going on in your life, try to think about and express gratitude for at least one thing for which you are grateful. There's a quote that was written by an American author by the name of Melody Beatty, and it says, and I quote, gratitude turns what we have into enough. So now that I've shared a, a, quite a bit about what's in my leadership wheelhouse, it's now my turn to ask you, what's in your wheelhouse? What's in your leadership wheelhouse? Does your leadership wheelhouse contain wisdom, humility, ethics, executive presence, listening skills, happiness, objectivity, uniqueness, strategic thinking, empathy? That was a cool acronym, right? Um, I'm arguably biased, but as you know, I could have selected 10 completely different words for the wheelhouse acronym. The point is your leadership wheelhouse is personal. There's no one size fits all approach to building a leadership wheelhouse that's right for you. So as I close, I, I wanna leave you with a call to action. I want to challenge each of you to operate on your edge as leaders, being intentional and purposeful about identifying, honing and refining the key elements in your personal leadership wheelhouse. And simultaneously, while you're making sure that your leadership wheelhouse is appropriately equipped, I challenge each of you to seek out new thoughts, new ideas, new partnerships, new ways of looking at things with new people while operating with an open mind, an open heart, and a new sense of purpose so that you can build an acumen, a whole new operating system, and leverage the personalized contents of your leadership house, wheelhouse and be one of the leading, go-to, loudest, and most impactful and sought-after leadership voices that drive positive change. You know, I'm challenging each, I'm challenging each of you to go to your edge even go beyond your edge, because that's what it's gonna take. And as you continue on your personal leadership journey, never ever forget that you have earned the right to be here at this moment, in this time, to learn, to grow, to explore, and to lead. There are certainly no imposters here. And you know, for many reasons, I am bowled over with great hope and optimism. I had the opportunity to attend a luncheon earlier today with some of the honor students. Some of them are here today. And just seeing and meeting uh, many of you in attendance this evening. And no pressure, well, maybe a little. I, I do want you to know that I and many others are counting on each of you to leverage every tool in your leadership wheelhouse to build a brighter, more peaceful, and more equitable world for all of us. And please know that I will not only be cheering you on from the sidelines, but I will be continuing to do my part to make the world a better place. Remember, that's my mission, my passion, and my calling. So it's my fervent hope that something I've shared with you this evening will empower, motivate, inspire and even light a fire within you to rethink possible and do that as you make your personal mark on the world. And just to make sure that you're staying on the right track, periodically channel your best Samuel Jackson voice and ask yourself the question, what's in my wheelhouse? And certainly the answer may change from time to time, but I'm hopeful that you will be intentional about making sure that the key elements in your leadership wheelhouse significantly enhance not only your own life, but the lives of many others. 
So let me say congratulations again to each of you on your amazing achievements to date and congratulations in advance on what I know will be a successful future for each of you. It's been my absolute pleasure and an honor to share this priceless moment with you. And let me thank you again for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Richardson, thank you for your wonderful words of encouragement, for sharing your wisdom. Um, I promise I won't go beyond a minute, so I'm gonna make this real fast, but I do have to kind of jump through five quick things for what I want to say. I'm very inspired by what you just uh, said. A, um, I want to assure you I am old enough to have remember the AIDS um, epidemic. Um, I, Puerto Ricans had a huge death toll uh, mm -hmm. with regard to that crisis. And my aunt Anna was one of the victims of um, Anthony Fauci's catastrophic handling of that health crisis. And so in partly I'm asking this question for her. Um, also, I want to assure you that my question is out of uh, love and respect. Dr. Richardson, you are every woman of color's dream. You, you are what I hope and dream my students can be. And the reason why I get up every day to teach them. And you are my dream and my grandmother's dream and my mom's dream. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to ask you this uh, in a respectful, loving manner. Um, uh, two things. In your role as a physician and as uh, someone who was at the table in the handling of the COVID pandemic, you must have uh, be appraised of two things. Number one, how so many members of our communities were being branded anti-vaxxers and ignorant and stupid and backwards uh, because we were asking excellent, thoughtful questions. And also, uh, in light of all the research and news coverage that has been done now where we have found that Pfizer could not be bothered to test to see if the vaccines were, were going to transmit the, uh, the, the virus or not, uh, of hiding the data on adverse reactions and all of that. I wanna ask you, Dr. Richardson, having been at the table, do you have any regrets as to how that was handled? And as a leader, do you learn a lesson in that respect? Um, and I thank you for answering this question. It comes from a loving place. Well, first of all, let me say thank you um, for the question. Um, my condolences for the loss of your family members. Yes, the AIDS epidemic was devastating for me as well as a, a new physician. But it, again, it, it really helped me shape my resolve to do whatever I can to help those, particularly those who are less fortunate. Um, secondly, to your question about having any regrets, um, I, I shared a little bit with the students um, that I met with at, at, um, at the table um, earlier today. My biggest regret um, is that um, the medical professionals and the regulatory agencies really, in my opinion, did not do a good job of, of working in partnership um, in getting a, a cohesive message out to the community at a time when we were all struggling to find answers. Um, even I, as a physician, found myself more often than not on the television, you know, uh, you know, I was learning about COVID, you know, it wasn't like we had a playbook, we didn't know all of the answers. And so I felt like there could have been much more authenticity and honesty on the part of the people speaking. And there also should have been, in my opinion, much more cohesion. And I'm not suggesting that everyone had to be saying exactly the same thing but I think there should have been much more authenticity and honesty about what was happening. And if nothing else, making it clear to the public, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. To your other point about marginalized communities, that's I've prided myself on always working with marginalized communities. And we didn't see marginalized communities uh, or underserved communities as anti-vaxxers. There were people who are anti-vaxxers, but part of my role um, for the organization was to actually go out and talk to people who had 
questions, great questions about the vaccine. And my approach was to meet them where they are. I did a podcast earlier with Abby and Abby asked me, what would I have said to her as she was thinking about, you know, whether or not she should be vaccinated? And she had some concerns. And my first question to her would have been, tell me your concerns. Let me try to help you. We know that marginalized communities, unfortunately, have reasons to not trust vaccinations or the medical profession because of the unfortunate historic transgressions that we've all faced. But as a physician, I also know that marginalized communities were impacted most. And I felt responsible for trying to break through some of that hesitancy because the alternative, unfortunately, of what I saw was they were dying in droves. So I hear your concerns. I respect your perspective. Was it perfect? No, but I'm really thankful that we are now sitting in this room and able to be sitting in this room. It's not a perfect vaccine, but it certainly helped us get out of our basements or at our homes uh, in a place so we can start uh, coming back to some semblance of normal. I just want to say that, you know, when we talk about normal, I don't think the world was so great before COVID. So I don't want to go back to the way we were. I want to actually move forward to a better place than where we were. Because some of the things were already broken before COVID, COVID just exposed how broken things really were. So I hope I addressed most of your questions. And I really appreciate your kind words um, and your heartfelt sentiments um, about me personally. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph. And simple question I have is um, similar to what she just um, said or asked. How do you, like, lots of times, um, like, um, minority groups or the administ um, administrations always have ways of downplaying minority groups when they come up with ideologies or try to like ask relevant questions or come up with like ways. And this is not just in like political settings, but also in even in corporate world where we work, sometimes um, there might be an issue at the workplace and you try to come up with a better idea. and probably because they look at you as someone of from a minority group or something similar of of that um nature they, they try to downplay you but then someone in that room might take that same idea up and then like everyone starts giving the person like a round of applause like this is the point we've been like expecting like i think my question is like how do you advise younger generations to like deal with that because honestly these um our younger generations are becoming a little bit more fierce and we are trying to like be outspoken no matter what so like how do you encourage or advise us to go about this without like trying to come off as rude or being disrespectful to the people in leadership Joseph, that's a, a fantastic question. If I had a dollar for every time one of my ideas was picked up by one of my former bosses, I'd be probably a gazillionaire by now. And it doesn't make it right, right? Um, it happens all the time. So I just want to validate that what you're saying absolutely happens. Unfortunately, the um, systemic and institutional racism um, that has existed for centuries is still around, right? And I think the best thing that you can do is to acknowledge that it exists, <clears throat> but most importantly, do your part to change it. And what do I mean more specifically? When you're in these groups and, and you feel that you're being disrespected, um, don't do anything to jeopardize your career, just as I told in the story when I had the boss who really didn't respect me, but rather continue to do a good job. Speak up respectfully, make it clear. And I always like to, to tell people to use concrete examples because if you talk in generalities, people will say, ah, oh, that didn't happen. But if you're able to say at this meeting on this day, I gave this idea 
No one paid it any attention. And then next, uh, at the next uh, meeting, it was being presented as someone else's idea. Sometimes you do have to confront it in that way. It gets exhausting. Um, but I hear what you're saying. You're not just speaking about your ideas being taken. You're talking about the general disrespect that people have for some, that some people have for minorities. I wish there was a way to kind of wish that away, but it exists. And so I think what I see in your generation is that you're kind of not taking it anymore, right? Um, and you're making decisions about where you work and how you work uh, based upon the culture that is there. Um, I was telling someone, I think it was last evening, and I'm an executive coach and I'll be in business forever because many of the leaders um, that are in some of the major uh, companies operate under that mentality. And the younger generation is just not willing to accept it. So I think the short answer that I want to give you is to continue to excel, continue to demonstrate your abilities, your experience, your expertise, call out behavior respectfully um, when it's happening. Um, and I just, I'm a firm believer, like I said, what goes around comes around. I mean, there will be a day where you don't have to fight that battle, but then unfortunately there's no magic bullet to address it now other than continuing to do great things and excelling. I wish I had a better answer. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Mary Ann Gerard, and I'm a faculty member in the biology department, and it's an honor to hear you speak and Thank to you. hear these great questions. I wondered if you could speak to something that I teach my students about, and it's very distressing regarding black women and maternal mortality and infant mortality. When I first read the stats a couple of years ago, I thought they were wrong but they're not. And I just wondered if you had any comments about how I, how I as an educator can communicate this to my students and, and help them to be inspired for agents, to be agents of change. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you also for your teaching biology. It's really similar to what, what, what Joseph was saying. You know, black women, unfortunately, are not given the respect they deserve when they are um, pregnant. Um, they get inferior care, and it's not because they don't have insurance. You may know that Serena Williams almost died in childcare, right? In childbirth, right? And it was because people didn't pay her any attention when she clearly knows her body and she said something's not right. If she hadn't persevered, which I'm asking Joe to do, right? If she hadn't persevered, she might not be on this earth and would be another tragic loss. So, um, you know, the data is out there, right? We know that it's happening. Um, there are, unfortunately, there are people who are now, there's a study, you might've seen it, that, that um, pregnant women now only want to be treated, African-American women only want to be treated by African-American doctors. There's so few African-American doctors to begin with, it's less than 5%, right? But they're flying from state to state because they know that the um, African-American doctors will give them the care that they need. Many of them will be. So I, I don't also don't have an answer to that except to say that, you know, this is one of the issues um, like racism, like, you know, sexism, um, like, you know, all forms of discrimination. We know what they are. It's just going to take transformational leaders like each of you in this room to take a stand like Mr. Howenstein did and make a difference. And I think if enough of us, you know, are willing to, to put our necks out and do that, we will start to see change. Um, but it's slow. Okay, great. So thank you again, everyone, for your time. I think we have a reception. So if, if anybody's question didn't get answered, feel free to come up to me. I'm more than happy to answer your question. I'm just so thankful that, that those of you here in the room and those who are you know online joined us. And I do hope that something I said will inspire you to be that change that we need to see in the world. Thank you. I hope you guys are jazzed up. <laughs>
if you were with us for the last Meyer Lecture Series, you know I also say that a lot. I get jazzed up really easily. Um, but thank you again. Um, thank you, obviously, to Dara so much. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope you can join us for our reception out in, um, in the hall where we have some food and um, beverages for us all to enjoy. And I hope during those conversations you can spend some time reflecting with the people around you about what may already be in your leadership wheelhouse. I think that that is a great thing to take away, a great thing to reflect on. Um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, travel safe home. For those of you going to the President's Ball, have a great time. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.